Thank you for tuning in to Crops TV today. My name is Ashley Dean, and I'm an Extension Specialist for Field Crop Entomology here at Iowa State University. Today, our episode is about corn rootworm variants that are resistant to crop rotation. And the reason that we have this on Crops TV this year is just because we heard so many uh, stories from people about how they feel like they have variant corn rootworms in their field. They see um, injury to first year corn fields, so corn fields that were soybeans the previous year. And so um, it's it's possible that they could have um, these corn rootworm variants in those fields. So we'll Today, our, our goal is to understand corn rootworm biology, primarily because this is uh, what has changed from the normal corn rootworm population to these variant populations. And then we'll take a deep dive into what we know about variants. And um, in full disclosure, there hasn't been a lot of research that has been done specifically on corn rootworm variants in the past decade or so. So we'll just briefly go over what we know about corn rootworm variants, and then how can that help us kind of plan for the future or manage for the future. So we'll start with a little bit of corn rootworm 101, um, just get us reacquainted with corn rootworm. So we know that there are two species of economic importance in Iowa. We have the northern corn rootworm on the left here, which is the little green one. Sometimes you might see this same beetle, but it's kind of a tan color, and that's pretty common for when they're just emerging from the soil. But it's the little green one that doesn't have any other markings on it. That would be the northern corn rootworm. And then we have the western corn rootworm. This one is probably familiar to most people who grow corn in Iowa. So this is the one that has a yellow body and it has black stripes that can sometimes overlap and look like a smudge. So these are the two species that we really care about as far as economic injury in Iowa. Corn rootworm has an annual life cycle. It goes through one generation per year, meaning that it just goes from an egg to an adult one time every single year. Right now, in January, they are overwintering as eggs in the soil. And then those eggs will hatch, usually starting in mid-May and continue through June. And once those eggs hatch, larvae will feed on root, on corn roots in the soil for about three weeks, three to four weeks, depending on temperature. And they go through three instars, so they're getting bigger and hungrier with every instar. Once they've wrapped up feeding, typically this is um, sometime in June, usually mid to late June, they will enter a pupal stage, and this is just a resting stage. They're doing a big transformation from that larva to an adult, so they're just resting, and that takes about a week. And then once that pupal stage is over, they will emerge as adults, and this typically happens late June to early July. That's when we would typically see the first adult corn rootworm come out of the ground, and we'll pretty much see them throughout the duration of the growing season. So they're eating, mating, and laying eggs for about six to eight weeks in corn. So I mentioned that that adult emergence period is quite long. So they can actually emerge for six to eight weeks, and then they're feeding and mating for six to eight more weeks. So that's why we can see them throughout the entire growing season. If you were to be scouting a field and you had both species in that field, what I would expect you to see is um, sort of the first beetles to come out of the ground would be western corn rootworm males, and then western corn rootworm females, and then northern males, northern females. So the males emerge before the females, and the westerns typically emerge before the northerns. Lately, we have been hearing a lot of reports from people who are scouting throughout the growing season saying that they feel like emergence is quite delayed in certain fields, and maybe if they're using sticky traps, they're not getting um, a good representative sample of that field just based on when these beetles are emerging. And I think that could have a few different causes. It could simply be that adults are emerging later based on soil temperatures because their development is primarily driven by temperature. But it could also be this phenomenon, which has been recorded in the literature, where any time those larvae are exposed to something that's trying to kill them, so that could be a soil applied insecticide, a seed treatment, um, it could be a transgenic, either a BT or an RNAi. If it doesn't kill the larvae, it could be you know less than a lethal exposure, or it could be that they are resistant. 
It usually takes them a bit longer to complete their development and emerge as adults. And so that's kind of what this graphic is showing. It shows kind of the normal rootworms that wouldn't be exposed. And then typically what we would see is probably those exposed individuals that somehow survived that exposure, they would emerge a bit later in the season. And so that could be one of the reasons, but it, it also reinforces that we should scout throughout the entire growing season just because of those complications. And so this is another graphic just explaining, we can see those adults pretty much all throughout the growing season once they start emerging in late June or early July, all the way until the first freeze, which is typically happening in October. So the average first freeze in Ames is October 7th. For our northern counties, it would be slightly before that, most likely, but we can see them all the way through the growing season. And it's not uncommon for us to get reports from people that they are seeing adults, you know, feeding around their houses and things like that all the way into October. So we can see them all throughout the growing season. Once those adults emerge, one of their primary goals is to mate and lay eggs. So corn rootworm females are laying eggs over um, about a 60-day period during the summer, and they're entering the soil multiple times to lay small clutches of eggs. So those clutches will have about 35 to 50 eggs, and typically they'll have a total of 250 to 500 total eggs per female. And so that's how those populations can really grow over time. Most of those eggs are found about four to eight inches below the soil surface. They can certainly be closer to the soil surface or um, deeper, if, uh, especially if drought cracks are present, which we've certainly seen the past few years with this drought in Iowa. But usually it just depends on how deep their, the cracks are in the soil, just because those beetles typically are not going to be burrowing or digging in order to enter the soil, so they need some sort of a crack in order to get down in the soil and lay those eggs. And this is usually happening when it's cooler and uh, not so sunny, so usually early in the morning, late in the afternoon or evening is when they'll be doing most of their activity. A really common question that we get is how cold does it have to get over the winter in order for corn rootworm eggs to die before they hatch in the spring? And this answer is a little bit complicated, but it seems like from the literature that it takes a temperature of 18 degrees Fahrenheit in the soil, so that's not air temperature, that would be soil temperatures, in order to kill those eggs. But it also can't just be one short exposure. It seems like it has to be sustained cold exposure, so a, a period of, you know, 5 to 7, 14 days um, in order to kill those. And that range is sort of based on a bunch of other soil factors. So these maps on this slide are from two different years, but if we look at the top one, that is the four inch soil temperature for February of 2013. And this was maybe the last time that we all remember getting soil temperatures that were like really, really cold. And so you can see the darker blue on that map in Northwest Iowa and sort of down into central Iowa. There probably was a, quite a bit of egg mortality in that year because those temperatures did get down to 16, 17, 18 degrees. The bottom map is from December of 2022, where, you know, we've had really high corn rootworm populations, um, likely because there wasn't a lot of winter mortality. And in that particular map, most of the state is still above freezing. And I looked at the soil temperatures as of January 11th, and it seems like um, most of the state is still largely above freezing. So there's still a lot of winter left, though, so the temperatures could get down to a point that could cause mortality. But as of right now, we're likely not seeing a lot of egg death in Iowa. There are a lot of other mortality factors, so how deep are those eggs laid in the soil? Soil texture, but mostly as it relates to moisture in that soil and also temperature of those soils. And then a lot of residue and snow cover is acts as a very good insulator for the soil. So anything, not just corn rootworm, but anything that's in the soil, um, if there's a lot of residue or snow cover, will have a much better chance of um, surviving the winter just because those those soils are nicely insulated. 
Some other common questions that we get is, you know, does manure, tillage, or cover crops impact corn rootworm survival? And there isn't any evidence in the literature that any of those things either harm or help corn rootworms. The reason that we care so much about corn rootworm is primarily because the larvae are causing injury to corn roots. So they are literally consuming the corn roots, making the root system smaller, disrupting nutrient and water uptake, and making that plant unstable. So we get yield loss simply because, you know, the plant is unhealthy. It's not getting enough nutrients or water because that root system is so small. But we also get yield loss when it comes to actually harvesting those plants because if the plants are lodged enough or laying on the ground, it can be really, really hard to pick those up off of the ground. We also have the added component of potential ear contamination where we could have reduced seed quality at harvest just because those ears are so close to the soil surface and they could be contaminated with pathogens. Sometimes if those roots aren't completely consumed by corn rootworm larvae, some of the other symptoms can be very similar to other things that could be going on with that corn plant. So especially the picture of the nematode injury, the top left picture here, um, some of that discoloration that's happening with nematode injury can also occur with some of the, some of the minor feeding from corn rootworm larvae. And um, so that's where, you know, just caution to take into account all of the different things that might be going on in the field so that we know um, if it is a corn rootworm injury. Because nematodes, diseases, different planting conditions, and other abiotic factors could also cause symptoms above and below ground that are similar to corn rootworm issues. So we talked about the life cycle of corn rootworm um, earlier in this presentation, but when we think about the difference between a normal corn rootworm and a variant corn rootworm, what it really comes down to is a difference in the biology of these beetles. So with a normal corn rootworm, those females will lay their eggs in corn similar to, you know, what we talked about earlier. And if the field is rotated away from corn, the larvae will essentially starve because really the only thing that larvae can survive on is corn roots. And that's why crop rotation has been so effective for most of the time that we've been managing corn rootworm, um, just because if we rotate away from corn, the larvae will, will starve and die. With these variant corn rootworms, the northern and the western have both adapted to crop rotation in two different ways. So the northern corn rootworm, the little green corn, corn rootworm, is the one that has what we call extended diapause. And so they pretty much do what a normal corn rootworm would do. The females will lay their eggs in corn during the summer, during the growing season, except those eggs will remain in the soil for two or more years. So the females will lay their eggs in corn, the eggs will overwinter, and instead of hatching that following spring, they remain as eggs in the soil for one more year and they'll hatch the following spring. And there's actually some evidence that um, it doesn't always happen after two years. There seems to be some variation. So they might hatch after one year. That would be a normal uh, corn rootworm. They might have to hatch after two years or three, four, sometimes five years. So there seems to be a little bit of variation within those populations. So um, essentially what they're doing is trying to um, ensure that the eggs will hatch and then the larvae will, will be feeding into a, a cornfield. And so this isn't necessarily a, a new thing. This was actually first confirmed in 1984 in South Dakota. And there is some literature that dates back to the 1930s that is talking about a very similar phenomenon, but they didn't know the mechanism for it. It wasn't until 1984 that we um, that researchers figured out that it was likely this extended diapause mechanism for northern corn rootworms. The western corn rootworm has adapted to crop rotation in a little bit of a different way. It's more of a behavioral adaptation, and this one is often called the soybean variant of the western corn rootworm. And so instead of the females laying eggs in corn like we would expect them to, they instead leave the corn field to lay eggs either in soybean or some other field nearby. And so what they are essentially doing is they are 
losing their fidelity to corn and instead um, laying eggs in a different field in hopes that corn will be planted there the following year. And um, this was first confirmed in 1987 in Illinois, although at the time the mechanism wasn't known. And so it was really um, into the 90s that uh, researchers figured out exactly what was going on with the Western corn rootworm variant. What kind of field conditions are conducive to corn rootworm variants? Um, there's really only one, and it's probably become very obvious um, as I've described what a corn rootworm variant is. But it is really just having a consistent corn soybean rotation for an extended period of time. And we've been doing this in Iowa in much of the Corn Belt for a really long time, uh, primarily because of all of the other agronomic benefits that come along with a corn soybean rotation. But it's also been really effective for corn rootworm because those larvae can only feed on corn roots. Um, and it's not super surprising that they have found a way to overcome this because these beetles are very, very adaptable to many of the things that we throw at them. So um, this map on the right-hand side here is from the USDA CropScape. They have a handy little feature that we can use that is called the corn frequency layer. And so what this shows us is for every field in Iowa, um, for the past 15 years, what crop has been planted in that field. And so it can tell us how many years out of those 15 has been in corn. And so I've tried to simplify this because there really are quite a lot of colors in this map, but um, basically any of those dots that are blue or kind of a purple in color is uh, fields that have been in corn basically 15 out of those 15 years. So that that would be considered continuous corn. Any areas that are gray are not in corn. So those are primarily cities or places that are um, in, in water. And then the red dots are areas that about 50% of the time have been in corn production. So in, in, in Iowa, what is most common is we see, you know, corn rotated with soybeans. So likely the other 50% of that time has been in soybean. So the numbers I have on the left side of this slide are a little bit of loose math just based on what we know about these beetles and when we started to see variants popping up in the corn belt. So Western corn rootworm variants are a little bit more um, simple to kind of uh, estimate how long it took to see a variant population pop up because they are not native to the corn belt. So they are native to uh, Mexico and Central America, and so they kind of made their way to the Corn Belt as corn became more popular in, in the Midwest. And so uh, we can kind of estimate that it was about 20 to 25 years after Western corn rootworm first established in the Corn Belt that we started to see those variant populations pop up in Illinois. The northern corn rootworm variants are a little bit harder just because northern corn rootworm is native to the upper Midwest part of the United States. And so I sort of calculated that it, it was about the same time frame, 20 to 30 years after widespread soybean production first happened in uh, the Corn Belt, which was kind of in the 50s and 60s. It was about 20 to 30 years after that that we started to see these northern corn rootworm variants with extended diapause uh, show up in our, in our area. With both of these variants, both the western and the northern corn rootworm variant, researchers have um, concluded that these are genetic traits. So these are changes in their genetics that are being passed on through their progeny. With the western corn rootworm specifically, it seems to be a geographic spread from the very first field that it was identified in. There hasn't been a lot of research done uh, since kind of that time frame, but it does seem to be more of a geographic spread. They have figured out that this is a genetic trait primarily because those western corn rootworm beetles that are variants will leave cornfields regardless of whether there's a food source for them in that field. So they will leave corn even if it's silking um, and there's an abundant food source for the adults. Uh, they will leave in search of soybean or some other field in order to lay those eggs. 
So the Western corn rootworm variant adults are more likely to move than the normal adults. Usually we see Western corn rootworms are uh, usually staying in the field that they originated from, not always because they do need to leave to find pollen, but um, typically they'll stay where they originated from, but these variants will move regardless of what's going on in that field. So it just seems like they've lost their fidelity to corn in order to try to make sure that those larvae survive and, and uh, have corn roots to feed on. So the northern corn rootworm variant is also a genetic trait, and um, I'll show some uh, limited data later about um, extended diapause. And um, it's been present in all of the populations that people have looked for it in, and it seems like there's a lot of variability within those populations. So sometimes those some some eggs from a particular field will hatch after one year, some after two years, three years, um, and and so on. So there's just a lot of variability within individual populations, and because they can. Um, those eggs can survive for three or four years. They can also adapt to longer rotations, which makes it a little bit more challenging um, for, for this particular species. The other thing is that they wouldn't have any disadvantage in continuous corn. So if, you're, if you have a continuous corn field, um, you're not necessarily selecting for these variants, but if there are variants in the landscape that end up in a continuous corn field, they wouldn't have any disadvantage, right? Because they'll always have corn roots to eat um, uh, as, lo as long as corn is planted in that field. And I think one of the reasons that we might be seeing so many issues with northern corn rootworms in general um, in recent years is that they just overwinter better than western corn rootworm. And so um, it, I don't know that that is specific to, to the northern corn rootworm variant, but they certainly overwinter better in general than western corn rootworms do. So a common question that we get is, where are these variants occurring in the United States? And so these maps are a little bit older. Um, I would say that they're a little bit outdated just based on some of the studies that I was reading where they were um, finding corn rootworm variants. It is largely unknown. There have been very limited studies on this very topic, but I would say that these maps are a really good starting point to try to see if perhaps we're at risk for these uh, variant populations. So I think it's really hard to do this research because you usually have to bring them back to the lab, do some lab assays, um, and that's just something that's um, quite time consuming to do. But also the other thing is there's no visual difference between a normal corn rootworm and a variant corn rootworm. So you can't look at a beetle and immediately know if it's a variant corn rootworm or not. The other thing is, even though we know that it is a genetic trait, we don't have any reliable genetic markers at this time. So there isn't any way to do a gene test on these beetles to see if they're variants at this time. So I mentioned that there were a few studies that have tried to look at this, and there was a study in Iowa, actually, the eastern part of Iowa, in 2008 and 2009 that attempted to identify where there might be variants present. And so they used an, a, a combination of emergence cages. So these are cages that are placed on top of the soil to capture beetles that are coming up out of the soil. And then... Um, also yellow sticky cards, which many people are familiar with. So what they found um, is that actually many of these fields were dominated by northern corn rootworms. So this means that many of the fields, uh, the, the green triangles in this map, were um, more than 70% northern corn rootworm. And with the emergence cages, so remember they're capturing beetles coming up out of the soil, in first year cornfields. They um, only found a few fields that they felt like northern corn rootworm was over their economic injury level in first year cornfields. So they felt like there were enough beetles coming up out of that field that were causing injury to uh, those first year cornfields that would be concerning. Their conclusions from this study was that in general, in eastern Iowa, there was a low prevalence of either variant, but eastern Iowa was more likely to have the northern corn rootworm variant than the western corn rootworm variant, so they were more likely to see extended diapause than that um, soybean variant. 
And um, they concluded that crop rotation was still a viable option for many fields in eastern Iowa, and there were very few fields that um, needed treatment in that first year of corn. So they felt like there were very few fields that actually needed a soil applied insecticide or a BT hybrid after um, soybean. In the same years, there was another study that was done in eastern Nebraska. And in this study, they actually brought beetles back to the lab, had them lay eggs, and then hatched those eggs out over several um, several years. And so uh, there was quite a bit of variation in these populations as well. But the, the sampling points that are um, within that red circle, they uh, kind of concluded that it was likely that those were more normal populations. So they had the highest proportion of egg hatch after just one year, which is what we expect of a normal corn rootworm population. Within that blue circle, all of those sampling points actually had the lowest proportion of egg hatch after one year. So they only had 10 to 16 percent of the eggs hatch after one year, which likely indicates that those um, fields have a variant population in them. And what I thought was interesting is in those uh, in those sampling points in that blue circle, the percentage of egg hatch in year two varied from five to twenty one percent. So sometimes there were more eggs that hatched after two years rather than just one year. And many sites had viable eggs that didn't even hatch after two years. So um, what they concluded is that if they had continued this study, they would have seen eggs hatching three or four years after they were um, initially collected from the adults. So they also found high variability in those extended in the of extended diapause within those populations. And they concluded that this is probably a gradual process, right? So establishment of these extended diapause individuals and then um, an increase in abundance of them is likely a gradual process. And I think this last bullet point is true uh, for corn rootworms in general, but especially for variants, they concluded that it's likely to go unnoticed until the proportion of the population with that extended diapause trait or um, any uh, uh, crop rotation variant is uh, sufficiently high. And on top of that, the populations have to be large enough to cause injury to that first year cornfield. So I thought that was a good conclusion just because I think that's true for corn rootworm as well because we have such good soils in Iowa. Sometimes it's really hard to notice above ground without digging up plants. It's hard to notice if there's something going on, but especially for variants, enough of those beetles have to have that trait in order for us to start to notice these issues um, happening in the field. So um, we always get questions about, well, how do I know if I have a corn rootworm variant? And um, there are a lot of ways that I think are not good ways to confirm a corn rootworm variant. So that's what I'm going to start with. So some common ways that don't actually work if you see um, lodged corn or just corn that's laying on the ground in a first year cornfield, perhaps not um, a good way to know if you have a corn rootworm variant. It might be your first clue that there could be um, corn rootworm injury or uh, probably something else going on in the field, but um, it's it's not an indicator of, of seeing variant populations. Seeing adults um, in first year corn fields, so seeing adults feeding or mating, seeing them on silks, um, seeing clipped silks, not really a good way to um, confirm a corn rootworm variant. Seeing adults feeding or mating in soybean is also not a very reliable way to confirm a corn rootworm variant. And lastly, capturing adults on sticky cards either in first year corn fields or in soybean fields is also not a super reliable way to um, determine if there's a corn rootworm variant in that field. And the reason for this is that Adults are highly mobile. They're looking for pollen. So I've talked about this a little bit, but in general, those, those beetles are looking for pollen. So they can typically find it in the cornfield that they emerge from. But if for some reason they can't find 
that pollen source or if that pollen source goes away, they will leave the field. They'll they'll go to soybean fields. They'll, they'll go to weeds. Um, people often see them on flowers near their houses. And so they're just, they're likely to move in order to find that. But typically they will go back to a cornfield in order to lay those eggs. In general, northern corn rootworms will move more than western corn rootworms, but variants of both are are more likely to move. And so one of the theories for especially the western corn rootworm variant early on was that maybe they like eating the soybean foliage more. And um, many studies that have been done have actually determined that soybean um, leaves are really a, quite a poor food source for corn rootworm beetles. And so um, seeing them eating there is not necessarily an indication of seeing a variant in that field. Um, just based on that information, you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, it may take a little bit more work in order to be able to identify a variant in a, a first-year cornfield. So um, one of the ways that, that um, could work in confirming that is capturing adults coming out of the soil in first-year cornfields. Truthfully, I don't expect anyone to be doing this. Um, these traps are usually handmade and they're heavy and bulky and um, it would be very difficult to carry these out to corn plants um, and in corn fields during the growing season. So I don't expect anyone to do this, but just know that this would be a good way to confirm because um, you should not be seeing adults coming up out of the soil in first year corn fields. Another thing that could work is finding larvae or pupae in a float test um, on first year corn fields. And so the float test is, is a pretty simple way to um, confirm whether there are larvae in the field, but it doesn't really tell you that much about what um, the population is like or if economic injury is happening. But in a first year corn field, you should not be finding any larvae or pupae. So all you need in order to do the float test is a spade, a bucket full of water, and a corn plant. So if you dig a, a plant out of the field, take all of that soil that came out uh, with that plant, put it into the bucket of water. After a few minutes, you should start to see the larvae and the pupae floating to the top. The larvae are um, quite distinct, I think, because it looks like they have two heads. So they're white with two brown tips on either end. Um, and if you were to find larvae in a first year corn field, that would raise a red flag for me. Another way that would work is if you were to dig up corn plants and see larval injury um, to first year corn roots. So these pictures are, are quite extreme. These are probably not first year corn fields um, in these pictures. Um, you may not see that significant pruning, so roots being literally chewed off to the base of the stalk. But um, if you saw any discoloration on those roots after you washed off all, all of the soil, if you saw any discoloration on those roots or any signs of feeding, that would also be a red flag because there shouldn't be any larvae feeding on those roots in a first-year cornfield. If you were to dig up corn plants and assess root injury using the ISU 0 to 3 node injury scale, I would not expect there to be anything on those corn roots, right? So anything over a zero would be unexpected injury for a first year corn field. And that's really the takeaway of this slide. There are some other thresholds on here that we use oftentimes when we're, um, when we're scouting for corn rootworm injury in really any cornfield. It could be a continuous cornfield or a first year cornfield, um, but we would use the 0 0.25 would be the point at which economic injury is occurring. And anything over a 0 0.5 is what EPA says is greater than expected injury for a pyramided BT trait. So all of these things apply, but the main point of this slide was just to say, if there is any root feeding, even scarring on those roots, that would be unexpected for a first year cornfield. And this is really why we care about corn rootworm feeding, right? Because larval feeding can produce yield losses up to 45% if all three of nodes four through six are, are destroyed. So um, each pruned node reduces yield by 15%, but it can be up to 45% just from corn rootworm feeding alone. So that doesn't even account for all of the other things that could be going on in, in a particular field. So that's really why we care about 
corn rootworm feeding and also why we encourage everyone to um, dig up some plants and assess root injury um, using that zero to three node injury scale. So there are some complications that come up when we are diagnosing variants. So I mentioned that there shouldn't be any injury to a first year cornfield, but I think there are some cases that that could happen. And it's in particular, the first two bullet points on this slide. If there is a lot of volunteer corn in a soybean field, so we saw this a lot after the derecho, but it can also happen for a variety of reasons. If there's a lot of volunteer corn in a soybean field, Beetles could be drawn to those patches or even just individual plants. And if there's enough feeding um, or enough beetles that are drawn to those areas, they could potentially lay eggs at the base of those plants. And then you could see injury in those portions of the field in first year corn. And this is also true for weeds. Sometimes they are attracted to weeds or weedy patches in the field. And so my main point is just to, you know, scout all of these fields, keep track of any areas that might have volunteer corn, large patches of volunteer corn, or large patches of weeds that could be a, a food source for the adults, and then subsequently they could be laying eggs near those plants. So if we know where those occur and we start to see some injury to first year corn fields, then we can be able to say, well, I had a lot of volunteer corn in that particular area of the field last year. And so maybe it's not a variant. Maybe there were just a lot of beetles that were attracted to this particular area. So I mentioned earlier that there hasn't been a lot of research related to variants in particular. Um, and so I don't have any research-based management recommendations when it comes to variants, but just based on um, what people have done out in the landscape or what, what people are recommending from other universities, I just hope to pro provide some options or some considerations for um, managing for these variant populations in the future. So um, this is just kind of a, a list that shows all of the different things that we can do for any corn rootworm population. And obviously the first one is cultural control crop rotation. This is the one, you know, that we're talking about today. Variants have overcome this. And um, so that has been the traditionally the best management option for corn rootworm because we don't have to apply anything to the soil. We don't have to have transgenic plants. Um, crop rotation has typically taken care of those populations, but um, with these variants, this is uh, where it starts to become a little more complicated. We also have biological control options, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. We also have transgenics, right? We have four BT traits for corn rootworm, and then we also have RNAi, which is a, a sort of a new, a new trait coming to market. And then we also have chemical options. We have seed treatments, we have soil applied insecticides, and we have foliar applied insecticides for adults, although that's not something that we typically recommend just because of that long emergence period and the long activity of adults. It, it would be very challenging to target foliar insecticide applications for adults and probably not cost effective for most people to make multiple applications. And so really the chemical options that we have are focused on seed treatments and soil applied insecticides. And um, these would all still be relevant when we think about managing variant populations moving forward. All of these things are still tools in our toolbox, but I will put a caution statement, especially on you know transgenics. When we think about Western corn rootworm in Iowa, there's evidence that populations have overcome all four of the BT traits that we have available. And so um, we just need to be mindful of that, right? We don't have any evidence that northern corn rootworm has overcome these BT traits um, in Iowa, but it has happened in North Dakota and some other places. And so we just need to be mindful as we move forward not to overuse uh, those technologies. Historically, crop rotation has been really effective for managing corn rootworm populations because the larvae really need corn roots in order to feed. So for any corn rootworm population, anytime that we can plant something that's not corn every two to six years, that's historically been very effective for breaking up that corn rootworm population and essentially resetting the field. 
Now, when we talk about variants, um, it might be worth it to consider a longer rotation if variant populations are quite high in that field. So um, any anything that can be done to increase the time um, away from corn. So corn, soybean, oats, um, corn, soybean, something else would uh, potentially help because um, especially with the northern corn rootworm, there are um, such a small proportion of those eggs that can survive um, over three years. So likely that would um, help us um, sort of ma manage these variant populations. Biological control hasn't historically been something that we've relied on too much for corn rootworm management. Um, there are some things in the soil that may feed on eggs or larvae that are that are in the soil. But as far as adults, we don't have um, really much for biological control. This is something that might be something to look forward to in the future. These are called entomopathogenic nematodes or EPNs. Basically, they are good nematodes, so they will kill their host, which is typically an insect, and reproduce in the body of that host. And so these are actually found worldwide in soils, but there have been some studies ongoing in um, the eastern part of the U.S., but also new studies specifically for corn rootworm in the Midwest that are looking at using EPNs, applying them to the soil, and using them for control of corn rootworm. And so specifically for the ones in Iowa, those projects are being led by um, Dr. Aaron Gassman, and I don't have any data to share on this, so it's not necessarily something that I'm recommending, um, but it's potentially something to look forward to as, as corn rootworm populations are just becoming more challenging to manage. And the last management recommendation that I have is, you know, if populations are high enough, if um, the risk for variants is, is quite high in your area, you could potentially use either a transgenic hybrid or a soil applied insecticide on that first year corn. So after soybeans, when you rotate back to corn, um, if, if the risk for variants is quite high for that particular field, you could use a transgenic or a soil applied insecticide. I haven't heard about it too much going on in Iowa, but um, after the the year that we've had where we've had quite a lot of first-year corn fields having injury by corn rootworm, people um, are starting to consider this. But if you do use something on your first-year corn field, like a transgenic or a soil applied insecticide, I would always recommend to leave a check strip. That way, um, so a check strip would be a part of the field that is left untreated that doesn't have that treatment that you used just to see if root injury is present or even if the um, the treatment worked as you expected. Perhaps, um, perhaps the field doesn't actually have variants and so that um, that treatment may not be worth it moving forward. So that's why I recommend leaving check, check strips um, just so we can actually see if it's doing what we expect it to do. Um, I just wanted to plug the handy BT trait table. This is updated every year. So the last update was last year in March in 2023. I really like this just because it tells you all of the BT trait packages that are out in the world right now. It also has a column that will tell you if resistance has been identified for each particular pest to all of the traits that are available in that package for that pest. So um, I recommend if it, for any uh, field that has corn rootworm in it um, to just check the handy BT trait table, see what traits are in the, in the corn uh, that you're planting, and then see if there has ever been a case of resistance recorded for that particular pest. So when we think about a long-term corn rootworm variant plan, um, the first step would be to determine your field's risk. So if you can, assess root injury in every field every year, regardless of if we're talking about variants or not. Um, I recommend this for just monitoring corn rootworm populations over time in general. But um, if you have some fields that you think might have variants in them, remember to assess root injury in those fields. If you see any root injury in a first-year cornfield, that would be unexpected. I would be wanting to see if I had any volunteer corn or weed issues in the 
in the field the year prior, that would be my first step. And then if that field was clean and there really isn't any other explanation, then I might start to be a little bit concerned about variance. Um, remember also that the economic injury level on that ISU 0 to 3 node injury scale is a 0 0.25, and um, anything over a 0 0.5 would be unexpected injury to a BT uh, corn hybrid that has a, a pyramid, so two or more BT traits. Um, even though adult corn rootworm populations are not really reliable for diagnosing variants, um, I would still uh, encourage people to go out and monitor adult corn rootworm populations. So just determine, you know, which species are present and active in the field. Um, if you're sampling later in the season, there's a pretty good chance that those beetles that are in that field will stay in that field and lay eggs. Um, so I would be curious what species are present and then also how many beetles are we seeing. If root injury is present in a first year cornfield or if you consider the field to be high risk when it's planted to corn again for a variant population, um, consider a soil applied insecticide at planting or a transgenic hybrid when that field is going to be in corn again. I don't think there's any reason to use both, so there's no real reason to layer a transgenic hybrid and a soil applied insecticide, so just choose one. Um, one should take care of um, any corn rootworm problems if there are any, and if those tactics are, are still effective. So um, a soil applied insecticide or a transgenic hybrid at planting if, if the risk is quite high for variants. And then um, for northern corn rootworm, consider an extra year between corn crops if variant populations are getting quite high in those fields. And as always, you know, good effective weed control and ensuring vigorous growth is, is always very helpful for ensuring healthy plants and nice big roots on, the, on those plants. So anything we can do to make sure that those plants are nice and healthy um, before we have pest issues is, is usually helpful. Some additional considerations when we think about corn rootworm is that corn rootworm populations are highly field specific, but sometimes the populations in those fields can be influenced by the surrounding landscape. And so I've heard from some people that they have a, a field that is rotated every year. So they have a corn soy, corn soy rotation going on in that field, but all the fields surrounding them are um, in continuous corn. And so they sometimes see that the in the corn years, when they're monitoring for beetle populations, they find quite a lot of beetles in those fields, but it's likely because there are just a lot of beetles in that landscape from the continuous corn. Mixed populations of corn rootworm can also be very tricky. So um, sometimes you might see um, fields that could potentially have a northern corn rootworm variant that has extended diapause, but you could also see BT-resistant western corn rootworms. And so um, those get to be fairly tricky when we think about um, management for, for first-year corn fields. BT hybrids are still effective against northern corn rootworm in Iowa, but I will caution that we don't really know that much about whether or not there's resistance happening in northern corn rootworm. The folks on campus are not actively doing research on BT resistance for northern corn rootworm. So I just caution, you know, um, let's preserve this as long as possible. So far, we think that they're still working, but we don't know what we don't know. And so um, I would just say if you are planting a BT hybrid and you see a lot of northern corn rootworms that you think are coming out of that field, let us know. That way we can stay on the front edge of this uh, issue as it develops so that we don't end up with uh, northern corn rootworm populations that are resistant to Bt. And then if you also see any issues with variants in your field, please feel free to let us know just because um, we would be interested in kind of tracking where these populations are in Iowa since we don't really have a good handle on the distribution of variants. I'll just end with a few plugs. So if you need some more information about corn rootworm, we have a, a, a web page dedicated to corn rootworm. This also houses all of the information for our adult trapping network. So I do this in Iowa every year, but I'm also the coordinator for a regional effort for an adult trapping network for corn rootworm. 
Um, I give out free traps every single year. So if you are interested in getting some free traps to monitor your um, cornfields, I would be happy to give you some free traps. Just reach out to me and um, I'll, I'll get you some traps for 2024. Um, and lastly, we um, have this new pest alert network where we send text messages related to insect pest activity. We've also recently started adding tar spot alerts with Allison Robertson. We just send text messages about pest activity, how to scout for different pests, management options, and um, any events or resources that might be relevant to um, insect pests. So you can scan this QR code or just simply search pest alerts at Iowa State and you can sign up and get um, text messages throughout the growing season. Erin and I are also on Twitter. We are fairly easy to find if you have any questions about corn rootworm or any other insect pests that you might be seeing out in the landscape. So um, we're happy to answer those. Thank you for tuning in today. I am Ashley Dean from Iowa State University. Mm-hmm.